Hi, and welcome back to Sisterhood in Surgery. My name is Dr. Linda Lay, and of course I have my co-host Dr. Palma Shaw with me today. And we will be discussing a very hot topic, uh, lack of representation of women and minorities in clinical trials, and we will have industry and clinical leaders' thoughts and opinions on this today. And we have three great guests, um, Dr. Samara McDonald, the Executive Medical Director of Silk Road Medical, Dr. Karen Rockman, Professor of Surgery and Program Director in the Division of Vascular and Vascular Surgery at NYU, and Dr. Catherine or Kate McGingle, um, Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of North Carolina. Um, and Palma, do you want to start off with the introductions? I'd love to. Uh, it's really my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Rockman, who's a professor of surgery and for a long time has been someone I've admired since I was a resident many years ago. Uh, she's a program director in the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at NYU, as you mentioned. She graduated from NYU School of Medicine and subsequently completed a residency in general surgery and a fellowship in vascular surgery at NYU as well. She has an active clinical practice in all areas of vascular and endovascular surgery, and additionally performs extensive clinical research in many different areas of vascular surgery. She's currently the president of the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery, which is a premier national vascular society. She has published extensively on topics pertaining to management of chronic stenosis in women and will help us to better understand how underrepresentation of women in carotid trials of, has affected our ability to make specific recommendations about treatment of carotid disease in women. Thank you, Palma. It's a pleasure to be here with this uh, esteemed group. <laughs> Um, our next guest is uh, Dr. Samara McDonald. As I mentioned, she is the Chief Executive uh, Director at Silk Road Medical. She's a vascular radiologist and honorary clinical senior lecturer at Newcastle University and the Freeman Hospital in the UK. She is well regarded for her career long efforts to improve endovascular interventions, is a uh, co editor of the Carotid Scenting, a Practical Guide, and she's authored over 70 medical publications on vascular disease, serves on many editorial boards, and is highly sought after as a speaker, um, having given over 300 international, international lectures. And as of last week, with her help, I consider her a dear friend who is, is, is so sweet and considerate. Thank you, Linda, for your kind words. It's a pleasure to be here. And last but not least, Catherine McGinnigal. Dr. McGinnigal is an associate professor of surgery at University of North Carolina School of Medicine. She received her undergraduate degree at Tufts University, her medical degree and master of public health in, the public, in public health leadership at UNC, stayed on there for her general surgical internship and residency, and did, did, then did her vascular surgery fellowship at Duke University. At her institution, she is the surgical director of the Enhanced Recovery after surgery program. In addition to her recent academic promotion to associate professor, Kate has published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery on sex-related disparities in intervention rates and type of intervention in patients with aortic and peripheral arterial diseases for, uh, from data of the National Inpatient Sample Database. Welcome, ladies. Thank you very much, it's an honor. Um, so remember, this is a live webinar, so if you have any questions, please turn them in and we will answer them throughout the show or at the end. You can join by web by going to pollev.com, enter DeBakey, or join by text by texting DeBakey to 37607 and text in your questions. So today, um, uh, we welcome all of our guests and, you know, we really want to cover two important topics. The first is underrepresentation of female and minority participants in clinical trials. And number two is the low numbers of female primary investigators running clinical trials. Um, so, you know, reading, um, Kate, your, your article, it doesn't seem like we've, we've made much progress. So we'd love to hear all of y'all's opinions, both from the uh, clinical uh, surgeon view as well as from industry. What, what are we doing wrong? Yeah, well, I think that it's it's fair to say that this is a place where we can improve. Mm -hmm. um, over the last 10 years, there's been uh, 97 trials done in arterial diseases, uh, coronary disease, uh, dissections, aneurysms, and PAD. 
I said coronary, but I mean carotid, of course, I'm sorry. Um, and 76 of those are industry sponsored. Only 9% of them had a female PI. And when you think about the number of vascular surgeons who are experienced enough to be a national PI, there's maybe only about nine or 10% of people who would have been candidates at the beginning of that study period. Um, but now, of course, there's many, many more, but the, the needle hasn't really moved. Um, being mindful about that is, um, is the first step to getting more women investigators involved, I think. And, and Karen, what about, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I think, I, uh, of course, I think Kate is absolutely right about this. And I, I, to me, the way to express this to people is to take a specific example. And I think the area of carotid disease is a very specific example where the lack of women in particular in our seminal clinical trials has really hurt us for decades now. And we have no way to make sex specific recommendations about the treatment of carotid disease, even though we know of course that women behave differently, they have strokes differently and they have different outcomes from treatment. And uh, awareness is everything. And when you say to people in ACAS, for example, which was a well-designed trial at the time, and I'm sure all the investigators meant to do the best job they possibly could, but if I'm correct, I think only 280 women underwent carotid endarterectomy in ACAS. And then of course, the outcome showed that women did worse. They had a significantly higher rate of perioperative stroke and therefore a significantly decreased benefit from carotid endarterectomy. And this has haunted us for decades because we really don't know if it's true. The trial did not have enough women, was not uh, uh, appropriately powered to give outcomes in women. And then over the next several decades, we had lots of institutional database registry information that showed that women had equal outcomes. So what do we believe? And this is still a controversy that everyone here is aware of. And it just goes to show you how not being inclusive to begin with can leave unanswered questions for decades. I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously, all of the landmark trials in the carotid space were underrepresentative of women. Uh, I would say around 30 to 35 percent were women in all of these trials so that you can't make definitive conclusions on the treatment of women. And therefore, what is your incentive, uh, you know, as a healthcare provider sitting in clinic with a female patient in front of you to offer them an intervention of revascularization when there, where there remains a degree of uncertainty? And so it's a kind of circular argument, and that's the problem. And then there's conflicting evidence, as you've said, Karen, there's some conflicting evidence. Even if you look at the transfemoral trials, you know, CREST, uh, the transfemoral arm of CREST versus CEA very definitely showed an uptick in stroke death MI hazards in women. But the pre-specified meta-analysis of the European randomized trials did not. And so I ask you, what's the difference between American and European women? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Right. You know, so, so confusion reigns. It's a circular argument. I mean, how do you incentivize yourself to focus on your female patients to put them into trials? And I think part of that is, is deficiency in the evidence base. And part of it is social. Part of it is social. What, what are the thoughts of everybody else on the panel? I agree with that completely. And I'd add that it's not just carotid disease, except that is an extremely salient example. Um, in the paper that I was able to participate in with first author Jessica Mayer and senior author J.R. Chung, to give them due credit, um, we found that only about 16% of trials in PAD and 18% of trial in aortic aneurysms had what we consider to be a representative uh, sample of uh, women. We didn't specifically break it down for minorities, but I'm sure that is even a larger problem. And so you're right, how are we supposed to set expectations on appropriate interventions and outcomes, um, much less make the diagnosis and get the patients into our clinic when we don't have the evidence base um, as a foundation? I think this level of uncertainty, as, as you said, Smyre, really does affect us on a day-to-day -day basis with our patients, because when that uncertainty is in your mind, and we all try to be scientists and practice medicine in, in an evidence-based way, we want to do the best for our patients. And when you're talking about a female patient, particularly an asymptomatic patient with carotid disease, where you're going to do a 
preventative surgery and it kind of is in the back of your mind i don't know if this patient is going to derive as much benefit we want to do no harm and it really does give you pause and it, again it's amazing to me that still 25 years later we're still in the same situation and, and and again i think that's what's so important about trying to be better when we're designing the trials in the first place Yes, now you may know Professor Alison Halliday from Oxford Clinical Trials Unit very well. She was the ex-president of the European Society of Vascular Surgery and a, a good friend of mine. And I was part of ACST2, one of the top recruiting centers before I left the UK. And she shocked me, um, you know, some years ago when we were se setting up ACST2 and I was on the technical management committee and the steering committee for the trial when she told me that from ACST1, the numbers needed to treat for female asymptomatic patients is 100 to prevent one event. And I thought, good grief, that's a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, why even bother? But that was one trial. You know, it kind of makes you want to put the brakes on. Uh, and, and I'm still not sure that we're doing the right thing just on the, on the basis of one trial's analysis. Uh, can can y'all comment on, you know, I was re uh, reading one of um, the publications about, you know, could this be because, m you know, many women, they're older when they present or um, when we do uh, intervene on them, could that affect, you know, the, the bad outcomes or, or what, you know, they consider a bad outcome, even though it's underpowered? I think, I think when we're, you know, I'm, I'm keep going back to carotid disease, yeah. which I think is slightly different. You know, women with aneurysms, it's kind of the opposite. We want to intervene on smaller aneurysms in women, right, to prevent rupture. And even patients with PAD, if they're not included in trials, we know that patients with critical limb ischemia require some sort of intervention. And that, to me, that's why, it, perhaps it's just my own interest, but why carotid disease is so interesting in this regard. Um, how do we do better? Um, awareness, um, certainly the idea of having more females as uh, principal investigators is important, but I don't think that alone will make us do better. We have to um, impress all principal investigators that they need to do better in this regard. Mm -hmm. So what would you, any of you think about the immediate next steps? How do we change this to uh, improve the clinical trial distribution of women? What, how do we start? I mean, all this has been going on. There's articles showing that from 2008 to 2020, very little has really changed. Things are really not changing. Although I agree, it's better recognized. What's our first, second, third step? If you were gonna change things today, how would you start that? Maybe Karen as a practitioner, Kate, and then Sumaira from industry's perspective. Wow. There certainly could be some sort of numerical uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, for for funded clinical trials to, uh, you know not only to make sure that women and minorities and other underrepresented groups are included appropriately but to have some sort of actual numbers relative to their proportion in the population or what we know of is to their proportion uh, uh, of people with the relevant disease i think you know, rules work. And and if those kind of rules are instituted, I think that would be a way to make a change quickly. I think that there's a lot of different things that can be done. And one of the great things is that we now have trial methodologists who study this specifically as their area of research. And, you know, I would note that the NIH made a requirement to include women and uh, minorities in 1993 and we haven't really made much progress since 1993. Um, in order to get funding for a clinical trial from the NIH you do have to specify how many um, females, males, and then every different major category of race and ethnicity should be included in your trial based on the disease prevalence. Um, the problem is, is that once they've committed to funding a trial, and this obviously goes for industry-sponsored trials as well, um, if you're not hitting those recruitment targets, it's far too costly to stop the whole trial. And so having checkpoints and, and targets and putting real numbers on it, I agree, Karen, is absolutely necessary. But then having steps that need to be taken 
in real time in response to that. And so you're not surprised at the end of the enrollment period. Um, I think COVID has shown us that there's a lot of distrust in the medical establishment in general. And so having your trial coordinators take classes on how to better explain trials, explain what the risks are. Um, I don't think that women are any more or less likely to agree to be in a trial um, than men, but certainly studying why we can't get them enrolled in trials is important and there's people doing that work now. Um, and then rearranging the way that we approach patients to get them in trials or to let them do telehealth follow-ups for if it's only a trial visit and not a clinical visit, for instance, um, helps alleviate some of the concerns about patients being older or maybe having other care responsibilities. Well, from an industry standpoint, I think the question I would have back to the panel is, is it the duty of a med tech device company to formulate the number of females that they put into their industry sponsored trials? Or is it in fact the responsibility of the regulatory and reimbursement agencies with whom they have to work very, very closely to get approvals, if I'm just talking about the United States alone, and to get funding for any new devices, right? So, you know, the, the, the FDA may say, so this is a second trial that you run in the United States. We, are, we want two thirds of the operators naive to the technology in your post-approval study. That's a, a good example of, of something that, that we came across at Silk Road Medical between Rhodes to One and Rhodes to Two. But at no point did they ever say, we would like to see 50% of your patients as female because that's representative of the, of the human population. Hmm. And you hear from Medicare about you know, shared decision making and their interest in the outcomes in females because of course the longevity of females is such that Medicare will be paying for them. But there is still no absolute imperative mandate or recommendation from either that I'm certainly aware of. And the same would apply to the European regulatory agencies and, and funding bodies, I think. And I think that's, that's the challenge that I see. And, and until we can kind of lobby them as best we can on, on the political front, I think it's still going to be very, very challenging to change that number from 30% or less for some of the peripheral trials to 50% or closer. But aside from women, what about underrepresented, underrepresented minorities? Uh, I know that at least in the Hispanic culture, there's such a diversity of the Hispanic backgrounds that oftentimes they're distrustful depending upon their prior experience at their previous, or the country that they're from. And they may not be trustful of doctors, they may not be trustful to enter trials or even come to the doctor. So I think that, there is some role as far as education of the different cultures that you're trying to recruit, which is obviously a lot of work on, on you know, to get everybody up to speed. What are your thoughts on that? Is it a missing link here? Or? I think it's an even more challenging problem because as, mm -hmm. as you said, Palma, people are diverse, right? And we can never make the assumption that all women or all members of a particular ethnic or racial group think exactly the same way about things. And that's what you know, that's what many of us love about being a clinician, right? You're in the room with a patient one-on-one -on -one and you have try as best as you can to tailor your approach based upon the patient's culture or what you perceive as the barriers are and, and, and try to present the information that you truly think is best for that patient. But I, I totally agree with you and what, with, with what Kate said earlier about COVID, about this bringing to light a real distrust in the medical system. For, for certain um, patient groups. And, and I'm afraid that I don't have an exact answer as to how to make it better. Um, awareness is first, obviously, but I think that's an even more challenging problem. I, I agree. I'm, I think it's, it's much harder, actually, when you consider the notion of ethnic minorities beyond a gender disparity. And I think part of that may importantly be more socioeconomic. You know, where can they afford to live? What are the sorts of jobs that they tend to go into? Do they have, uh, you know, paid time off the follow-up appointments if they're part of a clinical trial? Because they have to sign up for that, for the follow-up appointments. Mm -hmm. Can they get to them physically? Can they leave their jobs if they're young enough to still be working and get to them? I think there are some important socioeconomic questions as well. 
And again, they're not just one one group to everybody else's point. It's a, a very widely diverse population of minorities, for want of a better word. Well, and I think that all ties into, you know, talking about distrust of the medical system and maybe your physician, but that all ties into why we should also be concerned about, you know, increasing diversity in vascular surgery. I think patients are more trustful if their physician looks like them or talks like that, you know, um, you know, female to female. I know for a lot of my uh, vein patients and other, you know, vascular disease patients, they pick me because they're like, well, I, I want a woman. I want, I want a female mm -hmm. physician. So as you know, the more we become diverse, I think the more we can enroll patients and, and they would be more trusting um, you know, to, to undergo you know, being a, uh, in a clinical trial. I, I think that's a really important point. Uh, uh, I also have the experience where there are certainly many women who I know mm -hmm. come to me uh, because they would prefer to have a female physician. And of course, we want patients to be able to have, have and express those preferences so they're comfortable with their, with their physician or surgeon. Um, when we talk about um, ethnic or racial minority groups, it's harder for patients, right? They really may not always have that choice. And they may also may be more hesitant to express that choice. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really challenging problem. Yes, I mean, I think if you, I've recently read that commit 25% of committee chairs in the SBS are female. So they've made great strides and mm -hmm. around about the same percentage are fellows in vascular surgery uh, and about 34% are residents. Of course, I'm the honorary vascular surgeon on this panel as a vascular IR, but don't hold that against me. Um, you know, so I think they've made great strides. I'm not sure if the same applies to Minori other minorities, ethnic, no. racial minorities. I, I don't think that uh, applied. They, they haven't got as far, I think, as females have. Mm -hmm. and it's been a long time coming for females. No, and I think it's that only two or three percent of the SBS membership are black, for mm -hmm. example. Um, not to mention, I can't imagine getting care in a, a language that's not my primary language, much less consenting for a trial. And mm -hmm. how yeah. easy would it feel if you could speak with, for instance, a native Spanish speaker to get your care, and then how much more likely you would be to consent for that physician's trial. Correct, yeah. Um, and I mean, this is this is important, and this is, this is real, and the more that we work on this, then the more credibility we get. And one of, I, I don't know that anything really good has come of COVID, but one of the things mm -hmm. that has come from COVID is that we've gotten a lot more creative about how we deliver care and how we reach patients and how we're willing to interact with patients. And, you know, obviously for trial follow-up, you know, you do need to stick to a certain routine and you do need to have certain imaging tests at certain times, but there's a lot of creativity that I think we can bring into recruitment and retention of patients. Um, you know, whether that's a telehealth visit with somebody who speaks their native language, for instance. Um, and, I don't, I, I just think that this is a real time for all of us to just pause and what we have been doing and to figure out what we can take with us to do it better and not the same way as before. You know, and talking to people about clinical trials, particularly if you're talking about a randomized trial is even magnitudes harder than just talking to a patient about their regular patient care, right? Because mm -hmm. then you really have to say to the patient, we don't know what's best for you. And we're asking you to be randomized to different treatments and that, even in patients who are like you or like their doctor. It's a, it's a real specific challenge in its own right and even more challenging um, with patients who may have barriers to communication or, or access or otherwise have distrust of the system for some reason. Well, and, and they're already scared, and then now you talk to them about being in a clinical trial, so then they're like, well, I'm scared, and now I'm going to be, they're asking me to be a guinea pig to, you, to do something, right. and I don't even understand what they're asking me to do. So, you know, if I were in that position, I would probably say no as well. I think it's about levels of uncertainty and layers of uncertainty as well, the randomized trial. You know, the space uh, two German national randomized trial was... It was a three-way randomization of, of best medical therapy, transfemoral stenting, and CEA in asymptomatic patients with, you know, five-year life expectancy. And it transpired that it was too many layers of uncertainty and too many levels of uncertainty. 
to complete it. And 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 I understand that um, you know the, the German government pulled funding eventually because of poor recruitment. You know, it's exce- exceedingly hard, especially in asymptomatic patients, to recruit. But I think it's also, Linda, to your point, layers of uncertainty. That 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 already terrified that they need something doing a revascularization whether it's carotid or peripheral or you know realigning their triple a and then if you're going to say i'm going to flip a coin right, right for a random i'm going to flip a coin and no matter how hard you tell them i've been in this situation several times with cavitas acst2 and icss that i have to be confident i have to be in equipoise that you're not going to come to harm regardless of which way it goes it's very difficult for them mm-hmm. to get past the notion that ha- they have no choice. Mm-hmm. Because they, if you explain both options, they often have a preference. Yes, I agree. And that's the problem. So Samara, do you think that with respect to the roads to trial, I know that you and Karen had uh, co-authored an article on the low frequency avoidable errors during transcarotid artery revascularization uh, and using T-cards and alternative method uh, with overall an excellent safety profile, but when that roadster trial was designed, um, what what were you thinking about uh, with respect to eliminating disparities? Was that something that was uh, consciously built into the trial, or or um, could you just would you mind going into that? Well, I'm sad to say that you know it was not really contemplated at all, and I and I think the reason it wasn't contemplated at all was because it suddenly become it. Well, it has gradually become an expectation that you can expect a 32% uh, recruitment for female patients. And it was exactly 32% in rows to one and about the same in rows to two. And we did nothing about it. And, um, you know, I'd like to do something about that going forward if we have any ongoing studies. Um, so yet again, you know, the, the entirety of the evidence that comes out that, that populated that, that publication is a majority of male patients. Not that, you know, you, that, that there was any evidence of increased harm in the, patient, in the female patients, but, you know, we'd really have to try and do better going forward. Karen, would you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think you're exactly right. And, and, I, and as you said, I certainly we all could do better but i don't think this is an intentional thing uh, uh, and it, it's interesting to think about organically how this might happen do 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 uh principal investigators have hesitancy in approaching female patients i mean because we all know that women probably on the whole have just as many strokes as men right and have them at an older age and recover less and all those things so so uh, I don't think it's any malfeasance on anybody's part, but is there some bias? Do, do principal investigators have more hesitancy in approaching a woman about a trial, perhaps because of the lack of data that we have to begin with? Um, uh, it's interesting, you know, when you think about the difficulties in approaching anyone, as we said before, for a clinical trial, do the principal investigators have some hesitancy to approach some people because they expect that the cell will be harder or different? And that's very difficult to measure or know, I think. I agree with what Kate said before. I don't think it's that women in general would be less hesitant to participate, but there's something going on in these individual interactions that causes this to occur. I mean, and I think though, with all implicit bias, you know, you it's, the reason that this happens is because it's not intentional and we actually have to be intentional about making it different. And so if you're not working twice as hard to get females or minorities in your trial, then you're not going to succeed. And whether that's acknowledging that you as an investigator might have an implicit bias or acknowledging that, you know, you need to get, you know, extra FDE for your trial coordinator um, to really be able to translate everything appropriately or whatever the case may be like it has to be intentional it has to be built in and like Sumaira said earlier there's currently no incentive to build that in um, based on regulatory bodies and NIH policy so 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 Sumaira 
to comment on that, or I guess a question, because I definitely don't know enough about that topic, but the regulatory bodies, Medicare, I mean, why, you know, if women are living longer and ethnic minorities are found to have, you know, worse uh, outcomes and mortality, you know, why is there not an incentive for that? I mean, you know, are they just behind um, the times or, or what? What's the cause of that? Because I think if yeah, they well, make it a big deal, then then everybody has to make it a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wonder whether it's this kind of ennui, um, an expectation that is set in that you know it's just too much like pushing a heavy a heavy rock up a hill, mm-hmm. a very steep hill. You know, they want to be able to complete recruitment in a timely fashion. The industry wants to do the same. The longer it drags on, the more expensive it becomes. Um, you know, and, and, and the less meaningful it is because, you know, it's a snapshot of time when you report your, your trial results. Um, and, and I think it's just maybe that, uh, you know, a focus is required, you know, an active focus to, to Kate's point, you know, um, just have a committee sit down and think about it. Yeah. And I don't know whether it needs to come from industry first that approaches the regulatory bodies because we have to work very closely with them, you know, for trial design and agreement on their part. Or whether it's so many companies going to them and saying, should we do something about women? It's, it's you know, I don't have the answer, I'm afraid. I think what we're doing now, just talking about this and raising awareness is going to drive people to pressure the government and other bodies to move in that direction. So I think just educating people and patients that there are these disparities and that we want to know what the best care is for them and we don't have the answers. And this, But this is how we can do that and we want to do that. You can trust us, we're being honest, we want to know more, please participate in the trial and, and all those things. I, I think I wanted to have Kat, uh, Kate comment about her article um, and how the different uh, selection biases may have come into play in which intervention was offered. I know you, you covered a variety of things, including peripheral show disease, aortic, and, and carotid. And then um, what your thoughts are on that. And then perhaps Karen and Tumar can comment as well from their perspective. Or, yeah, so in the, the paper you're referencing, it was the, from 2000 to 2016, patients who had had an arterial intervention or operation and required an overnight hospitalization. And so straight away, um, you know, that means all carotid patients and all aneurysm patients are included. It's a little more complicated for peripheral patients just because a lot of that work is done outpatient, of course. Um, But certainly everyone who has a a bypass for inferior wound disease was included. And the, um, the findings of that study were that women or females with PAD were 30% less likely to be treated and 25% less likely to be treated if they had uh, aneurysm disease. And so, you know, we know that there's size cutoffs for aneurysms and that this is potentially life-saving therapy. And we have a lot of problems with determining who to screen for aneurysms, but these are all patients who have had diagnosis made um, who then don't go on to get treated. And so we're not treating enough women either. Um, And it's hard to tease that out. I mean, obviously most of the aneurysm trials were done in men. Um, Some of them were only in men and excluded women entirely. Um, But there's still size criteria that that we should follow for treatment. And so I'm not sure that that's a a link with lack of representation in clinical trials or um, related to not wanting to do open operations for people who have small iliacs, for instance, since we don't have low enough profile devices. Um, there could be a lot there to unpackage. Um, in PAD, women um, were more likely to get endovascular therapy as opposed to open bypass surgery for PAD. Um, and of the women who were treated, and this might be a little bit of a um, an artifact of NAS because it's patients over time, of course, there is less and less hospitalizations for PAD treatment because more of it's based outpatient. However, women were still more likely to be admitted, which I presume means more likely to have complications from endovascular therapy requiring an overnight OBS or an admission to the hospital. And so that I think just is reflective of how little we know about how we should be treating PAD. 
This includes CLI patients, CLTI patients, as well as Claudicants. And so there's a lot of appropriateness of use and shared decision-making that goes into Claudication treatments, similar with asymptomatic carotid disease. And there's just tons that's ripe for research there. Um, you guys on the call will be happy to know that folks with carotid disease were treated more equally. <laughs> <laughs> and that men and women were more or less offered uh, intervention, whether it was open endarterectomy or carotid stenting at about the same rate. Um, women were more likely to be offered open surgery though than stenting for whatever that's worth. Um, I, I think that? this is, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, but yeah, Karen, please. You know, this is a very multifactorial problem and I'm sure all these findings are in fact true, although one of the concerns about those kind of database studies is that you're, it doesn't allow you to get granular enough, I think, you know, to, to figure out why. Um, and, and certainly the, the discussion about treatment of claudication versus critical limb ischemia is a, is a whole nother topic. Um, you know, I, I have some particular interest and in, in kind of have been working on a project for a long time that, that is, is, has been a challenge getting finished about the outcomes of particularly women with critical limb ischemia and uh, particularly African-American women with critical limb ischemia, who uh, I feel like in, in my practice and in my division, um, anecdotally, I feel have particularly particularly poor outcomes with revascularization. And, and it's hard to, feel, it's, it's very upsetting. Um, and it's hard even in an institutional database to figure out why that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's separate from being offered care, which, which is uh, uh, another issue altogether. You know, these are very complex multifactorial issues and um, it's hard to know how to begin to tackle them. Well, I mean, one good way is to do clinical trials that include them because of then course, the absolutely, patient. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. I mean, and one thing that I think works certainly in the United States is, is for want of a better word, advertising directly to the patients, whether that's through educational pamphlets or great big billboards or programs that are affiliated with the Baker Institute or everybody else's hospital, you know, and just make it a focus of that that program to highlight female disease, vascular disease. And I know there have been others, but I think we just need to focus on that a little bit more. And that will also help feed into trials if there's one running in those institutions. So um, from this standpoint of industry, you know, I know Silk Road has a female CEO, but y'all are one of a maybe handful of um, many med tech companies that have men on the boards and CEOs. And so from the industry standpoint, why is that? And, and what are you guys doing to change it? Well, I'm, I'm asking the chief exec, I mean, you know, again, executive medical director is a woman and the CEO is a woman. So clearly y'all are like 100% of um, the, the top, but what about the other companies? Well, I'm going to quote from the House of Cards. You may very well think that, but I couldn't possibly comment. Right. So, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I think Silk Road Medical, you know, it is a certain sized company. It's growing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. It started pretty small, like many of them do when I joined, and it's grown very, very uh, quickly. I think to to compare and contrast that with a Medtronic that has multiple levels and uh, you know multiple layers and has been around for generations, it's they're two very very different beasts, and and I, I just do not know the answer, Linda, mm -hmm. about you know why they can't just have better proportional representation, just like the societies ought to, you know, and and I think it comes down to um, mentorship positive proportional representation and the will to do it now you know many boards of directors silicon valley etc they have increasingly looked for proportional representation especially for females and and uh, to an extent minorities um and i think it would be very nice to see that across more of the big med tech device industry um colleagues uh but they want they have to want to do it 
I thought maybe for the last uh, 10 minutes, we could just talk a little bit about increasing the representation of women and minorities in as a leader in clinical trials. Um, I mean, we're trying to, Linda and I, we're trying to mentor many young medical students, trainees, fellows, Karen and I are fellowship uh, directors, and, you know, we want to guide people. But I'm not sure I really know the secret The secret to that. I'm a site PI for a couple of trials. I've never run a big PI, I've been a PI of a, of a major trial, um, but I thought maybe some of the people on the call could give some advice that uh, that we or other young people can use to move in that direction. Karen, what are your thoughts on that? I, I guess I think it, it, it has to be a two-way street, and maybe Samira alluded to this. There has to be people in the upper echelons or companies or looking specifically to increase female representation, but there also has to be groundwork by the individual who wants to do this. Um, and uh, some of this, Kate and I were chatting before everyone got on, and she said, Basically, and I hope it's okay if I repeat this because I think it's a positive thing. You know, she wrote a couple of papers on the topic and is now considered the guru of this topic. And some of that, when you're doing good research and doing good work and publishing it and people take notice, a little bit of that happens organically, I think, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you have to be interested in a topic. You have to do some work, write about it, get published, get your name known, and I think then you're more likely to be thought of when someone is looking for a female candidate to run a trial. So I think it's a two-way street. And as Samara said, you have to want to do it and be willing to do the work. I'm going to push back on that a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, I absolutely think that that's true and that works for some people, but that is not going to be enough to meaningfully change how many women national PIs there are. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously doing good work, consistently showing up, taking engagements, letting people know what you're interested in absolutely helps. But if you don't have the mentorship and the sponsorship that Sumaira mentioned earlier, then it's going to take you a decade at least to be noticed for these types of things. Um, a lot of industry relationships are actually made through field connections. And as people who work for industry change and in their demographic profiles, I think that you know we'll see some improvement here, except in general, if you look at who does the lunch and learns and invited speakers and who are consultants, they tend to be white males. The field reps tend to be white males, and this is definitely changing. But those are the people who get the most face time, regardless of what they're publishing. And so they are also thought to be experts um, and are maybe equally as qualified and should definitely be the national PI of the next trial at that, you know, for that trial. But since, you know, 75% of the trials in vascular space are industry sponsored trials, if you are a young person who wants to get involved, mm -hmm. I would just tell your local rep and tell them to put you up the, the, the chain um, because it's, it is something that many different industry groups are thinking about and looking about and want to address um, and thinking that writing the most papers about it is going to get you noticed one day is, is not the most proactive way that you can approach it if it's something that you're interested in for your career. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Kate. I mean, it's uh, like I say, the squeaky wheel gets oiled, right? And uh, if you speak to your local reps for whatever company's devices you're using, that's very important, you know, way to get recognition. I think maybe it's also going to happen organically going forward, because if you have 25% of your fellows right now in vascular surgery, uh, female and 34% residents female, and hopefully that will continue to grow. Because if you look at medical schools, well, certainly in the UK, you can tell if it's wrong uh, for the, the statistics for the United States. Anywhere between 50 to 80% are females in the United Kingdom. So hopefully we can get up to a number where you can't ignore us as the minority going forward. Um, but, you know, honestly, Palmer, uh, and for the rest of the panel, it was partly through the Women of TCAR effort that Erica Rogers, our CEO, put forward that, you know, we, we really began to shine a bright light on this. And, you know, the next large trial that we will run has a female national PI. And I think that's one of our problems, right? We, we don't ask. 
we're, we're afraid to ask. I mean, not like all of us, but that's, you, when you look at, okay, why women aren't getting paid more than men, I mean, a lot of it is that we, you know, men can be demanding and they are looked upon as confident. You know, we are demanding and we lo are looked upon as, oh, well, she's like not very nice, right? So yeah. we just have to know our worth and ask for it. Um, any last minute comments? Palma, do you want to have anything to no, say? No, I just think this has been, uh, no, I, I just, I've learned a lot. I, I really enjoyed these uh, conversations and hearing from these incredible women. I mean, they're incredibly successful, but they just have so much to share. And I'm really happy that they were able to do that. And I think that, um, I think that if we just, um, I know at least for me to get involved with trials, I, I was always willing to be part of a trial, any part of a trial, because I think that they look at that. They, they, when people are reviewing whether or not they look at your CV, they want to know that you've done some clinical trial work, whether or not you've been a PI or not, at least you've been involved in several trials. So at least when I was uh, training and, and as a young faculty, I tried to, if my colleague was a PI of a trial, I, I tried to be a co-investigator co as much as possible so I could learn you know, the process and, and how these things run. So. Um, that's just how I've tried to work on that. So, any other thoughts from the, anything you're thinking of, Karen, Kate, or Samira? Advice you would give? Things that five years from now, you'll be like the first to say it. <laughs> yeah, any advice for our young viewers? <sighs> Hang in there and, uh you know, ask when you want something. If someone calls you a shrew, they'll get over it, and so will you. <laughs> True. Huh? All right. Well, great show. Yes, I can get. I can give advice from Lean In. When you walk into a conference room and there's a table in the middle of the room and there's chairs around the outside of the room, always go and take a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Or preferably at the front, if if it's set or at the front, front. <laughs> at the yeah. front, which is what I always used to do at V. Right, I go and find him in fact, and try and sit next to him at V. Right, at the front. <laughs> and practice and if you're that. in heels. Practice if you're in heels and a, and a you know a tight pencil skirt, which I also had to do. <laughs> well, he noticed you, Samara, so <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Frank loves you. <laughs> is V V the V meetings coming up? Correct, or did I? Yeah. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. maybe it'll be like maybe all these women will just swarm him and sit next to him <laughs> at the table. <laughs> you love, love it. it. Won't he? He'll love oh, it. He would love that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, He's good. thank you everybody for your time and your opinions and your thoughts. Um, it was greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, we hope this improves soon. Thank, thank you for so having me here. Thank you so much. Great honor. Have a good night. Good fun. Right.